Diane Wipert walked into her living room one evening. It was a room she quite loved in her apartment on the third floor of an apartment building somewhere in one of the major cities of North America. She loved it in part because there were three huge bay windows in the living room that let in a lot of light and let her see outside overlooking uh, this beautiful courtyard that her apartment complex had. But that particular night, she noticed something unusual. She'd lived in this same apartment for 15 years, and as she looked out her window at the end of the day, she noticed this glowing square of light. Never seen it before, and at first she couldn't imagine what it possibly could be. So she walked closer to her window, and she looked out, and she realized it was somebody else's window. She was looking across the courtyard into someone's bedroom. She could see the bed up against the window, and not too long, two people walked into the room, and they were young and attractive, both very fit and trim. And she was really surprised how clearly she could see them. And it stayed like this night after night. Every evening she could see these two young people in their bedroom. And they were a really cute, lovey-dovey couple who were often naked and doing the things that lovey-dovey couples do when they're naked, right there in her living room. And she couldn't believe it. She's like, don't you know <laughs> that people can see you? Why don't you close your curtains? Do you even have curtains? She thought about holding up a sign on poster board that said, buy curtains. <laughs> she confessed it never occurred to her to close her own curtains. <laughs> but this, this young couple became a fixture of her and her husband's life. Every evening, they were there, and she came to be filled with a lot of resentment, and uh, she wasn't thinking kind thoughts about them, in part for all the reasons any of us would be frustrated and annoyed by what she was seeing, but also she and her husband happened to have a very small child at the time, and if you have small children or have had small children, you know it's not the sexiest time of your own life. They were tired, everything smelled faintly of the diaper pail, and here were these two young people living this carefree life. She could see them sometimes when she worked from home, not sleeping till 11 o'clock in the morning. She could see them up on the roof of their own building, doing yoga together, just kicking back, relaxing. It seemed like they didn't have a care in the world, and she really resented them. But she thought, well, you know how young people are. They won't be together very long. So hopefully this won't be something we'll have to endure for some time. But they stayed. They kept being there every night until finally, as things do, even aggravating things do, you, get, you start to become used to it. And she and her husband used to joke about them, and they had no idea who they were. But they would notice, oh, they got a new house plant, or <laughs> they hung a new picture on the wall. And over time, they came to terms with it. Then one year, around Christmas time, they went away for an extended vacation. They went across the continent of North America to see family out west. And when they came home after several weeks, at first, they didn't even notice what was going on across the way. But then one night, Diane looked, and there was a new person in the, in the window. Not young and fit and so attractive. A little out of shape. She looked tired, world-weary. And there was a man in the room, too, who was skinny, unhealthfully skinny, skeletal even. 
And she thought, oh, wondered what happened to the other couple. Until she looked closely and she realized, wait a minute, that's them. It's the same couple. And as she watched them through the window for the next days and weeks, she noticed he was there almost all the time, either lying in bed, sometimes he'd be sitting up at his computer, but he was always there. She would come and go. She would be up with him late at night, very sad but tender kinds of interactions. And she felt so guilty about watching this, but she couldn't help herself. And then one evening, there was a group of people in the room. There was a middle-aged woman who she sort of gathered must be the young man's mother. There was another man that she thought, based on what she remembered him looking like, looked similar enough that that must be his brother. And the brother was pacing up and down the room. Apparently there were doorways on each side of the room and he would just kind of come in and out of view, pacing up and down. Other people came and went until very late at night. It was just the mother and the wife or the girlfriend, whoever she was, whoever she had been all these months. And they sat on the bed on either side of this skeletal man. And they were touching his face. They were wiping tears from their own face. A very tender, heartbreaking moment. And then both women lay down on either side of him. put their hands on his chest until one moment they both got up together and left the room. And she realized she had just watched this young man who not that long ago had been full, so full of life. She had just watched him die. The next time she looked at the window, there was some other people in the room. They were moving his body from the bed, putting it on a gurney of some kind. And she found herself so emotionally caught up and so grieved and so moved by what she had seen that she went down that morning. She, she went across to the building and watch them bring this man's body out and put it in a vehicle to take it away. And she didn't know what to do. But she just knew she had to be there. This is a story that I heard on a podcast a few years ago, and it's one of these stories that has stuck with me that I think about from time to time. And it's been on my mind these past several weeks. And I wanted to share it with you because it's a story about many different things. A beautiful story, a sad story. But one of the things it's a story about is how quickly we are often to judge others to categorize them, to put them in a box, to put a frame around them, much like the window framed this young couple for Diane. And in, not only do we categorize people quickly, but we, we judge them, we dismiss them. Intentionally or not, we reduce other people to specimens, and we often do it in an instant, in the blink of an eye. This story also reveals to us the perils of 
watching and living life at a distance. I think distance is one of the great ironies and challenges of our contemporary urban and digital age. And it's an irony because in so many ways we've conquered distance. I mean, any of us could pull out our cell phones right now and we could have a video chat with someone halfway around the world. If we had the means and the desire, tomorrow morning we could eat breakfast here in Toronto and we could eat lunch in Vancouver. We have overcome distance in a great many ways. And yet, we can also sit beside someone on the train or stand beside someone at the bus stop and be further away from them than we've ever been in human history. We can even sit at our own dinner tables and be miles away, thanks to those same devices that help us conquer distance in so many other ways. Distance isn't always spatial, but whatever form it takes, it almost always encourages, if not causes, us to dehumanize other people, to place less value on other people. And this has actually been proven through some behavioral studies, and I'll share one with you, a thought experiment that was developed by a British philosopher named uh, Philip Foot years ago, back in 1967. And I'm going to give you my version of her thought experiment. All right, so here we go. It's two parts. First part, imagine you are walking beside some train tracks. And the train tracks stretch far into the distance, and then they turn sharply. And between you and the tracks is a tall fence that completely separates you from the tracks. And you're walking along a point in the train tracks where it's not just one track, it's two. There's one track that continues on straight, but there's another track that turns and goes off. And at the juncture, or near the juncture of these two tracks, there are five men working. Four of them are working on the straight line, and there's one man doing a smaller project on the part that steers off. And they've got their tools out, they've got their their music box out there, playing music, they're, they're trying to enjoy their work the best they can. Some of them have got these earphones on that you, know, you wear when you're, when you're using tools that make a lot of noise. And then you notice this plume of smoke coming. And you realize there's a train coming, and it's coming fast. And you try to shout at the men on the tracks, but they're, they've got their backs to the train, they've, they've got their music going, their, their instruments are going. They cannot hear you, and they cannot hear the train. And you realize in just a few moments, you are going to watch this train kill these four men. But then you notice that not far from you is a lever And from your experience with Thomas the Train, you realize this is one of those levers that changes the points. And you think, if I pull that lever, I could divert the train away from the track where the four men are working onto the track where just the one man is working. What do you do? Do you pull the lever and sacrifice the life of one worker to save four? Or do you simply watch events unfold? That's part one. Part two, similar scenario, train tracks that run, they curve, except this time you're not beside the tracks, you're on a bridge above the tracks. And you're looking down on these same five workers. They still got their music playing, they still got their their tools humming, You see a train coming around the bend, and you realize the train is going to come and it's going to kill these four guys working on this track. But then there's a person with you, you notice. There's a guy. You don't know who he is. He's just a guy. You've never seen him before. He's never seen you before. 
But he sees exactly the same thing you do, and you both know that this train is going to come and kill these four people. And you're both shouting at the top of your lungs. The train can't hear you. The guys can't hear you. And this guy, because he's so concerned, he starts leaning way out over the edge of the bridge, trying to get their attention. He's waving his arms, doing everything he can. And it occurs to you, if you push this man off the bridge, he will land on the tracks, the train will hit him, and force the conductor to pull the brakes. And there just might be enough distance for the train to stop before it hits the other four. What do you do? Do you push the man off the bridge? Or do you simply watch events unfold. Now, the thing that's important to notice in both of these scenarios is the moral quandary is the same. The choice you are making is the same. Am I willing to sacrifice one life in order to save four lives? The only difference is the method by which you would make the sacrifice of the one life. But you pull a lever to make something happen over there? Or would you push someone standing right next to you over the side of a bridge? Now, a behavioral scientist at Harvard named Mark Hauser has taken Philippa Foote's example, and he has tested it with thousands of people, leveraging the power of the Internet. And you don't have to share your answer with me, but he has found... In all the years he's been asking people this question, nine out of ten said they would pull the lever. Nine out of ten said they would not push the man over the side. Distance affects how we value the lives of other people. And I think Philippa Foote's example reveals that the closer we are to somebody, not just in terms of relationship, but in proximity even, it affects how much humanity we project onto them and feel for them. I think Diane Wipert's story reveals that the inverse is also true, that when we spend time with someone even if it's just looking out our window, we start to realize that their lives are bigger than these boxes that we so often put them into, these frames that we draw around them. It draws us closer together. Remember, when, she, when they took this young man's body out, she felt drawn to go over there. She had to even though she couldn't get as really as close as she would like to, because that would have been awkward. I mean, what do you say? <laughs> Hi, you don't know me, but I've been watching your life through, your, <laughs> through my window for these last few months. I'm so sorry. She knew she couldn't say anything, but she wanted to be there. She wanted to be with them some, somehow. And the interviewer who was conducting this interview with Diane asked her, she said, you know, if you could, if you could tell this this young woman who's now been left behind, who's still living there in the apartment, if if you could tell her something, what would you say? And she said, I would want her to know There's somebody out there rooting for her who wants to see her come through this, to live, to thrive. Not just survive, but come to thrive. And if we look at the pages of Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, I think we can see this same dynamic playing out. Not just in the stories that are in the Bible, but 
in the mandate that has been given to God's people. It's been given to us. We've been given a mandate to close the distance, to go the distance, but to close the distance, to go to all nations, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, which is written on the mural right behind me, that you are loved. God loves you. You are loved. You are forgiven. We are called to go the distance, to close the distance, to do the very thing that Jesus did in his coming. It's what we say every Christmas. I mean, Christina's got her Christmas hat on. Jesus is God, Emmanuel, God with us. His very nature, his very being is an embodiment of the fact that the gap between heaven and earth has been closed. And Jesus' ministry is also about closing gaps. The way that he went the distance, took his disciples distances around Galilee and in Judea. He took them to different regions, Jew and Gentile. He took them to all manner of different people, eating with them, healing them, touching them, refusing to let them stay in the boxes and the frames of his first century Near Eastern world, defying convention, dispelling categories. And this is essential for us to remember. It's essential for us to remember always as the church, but particularly as we enter this fall, because our church wide focus for this program year, this school year that stretches from now until June is going to be mission, mission and outreach, about reminding ourselves that we are called to go outside of these walls. We may worship out here just one Sunday a year, but we're called to live a life, to live a faith outside these walls day in and day out, to proclaim the good news of this message of the gospel. And these dynamics are not just limited to Jesus, by the way. If we look in the pages of the Old Testament, we see that this message precedes Jesus in the stories of the patriarchs, the story of Esau and Jacob. It's one of my favorites in the Old Testament. But the part that we read today is a part we very rarely tell. We always talk about the conflict. We talk about how Jacob swindled his brother out of his birthright tricked him to giving it to him for a bowl of soup. How he tricked his father to blessing him instead of Esau, his older brother. Now he had to flee literally for his life. But then God comes to him after many years and says, you've got to go back. And Jacob is right to be fearful and wary of going back. But God says, I will be with you. Go back and I will be with you. And as Jacob approaches with all of his livestock, all of the wealth he's accumulated, his family, he's bringing two wives and many, many children back with him. His scouts tell him, yes, your brother Esau is coming. He's got 400 men with him. And Jacob's preparing for the worst. But when he finally comes face to face with his brother, Esau runs and embraces him, and they fall to the ground, and they both weep because the distance has been closed, and God has helped them to heal their relationship. This story, this mandate, it also proceeds after Jesus to us, the church, not only in the great commandment that we have been given, but in the reminder that what Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the ministry that we have been given, it is the ministry of reconciliation that once we realize that God in Christ has reconciled us, we are called ourselves then to be reconcilers. And the Greek word that we translate reconciliation 
It literally means to trade places. Specifically, it means to go from being an enemy to being a friend. And South African theologian Alan Bosak says that what that means for us is that if we are to be a people of reconciliation, if we are to be a church that enacts the ministry of reconciliation, we have to be a church willing to go and not just walk alongside other people, but be willing to trade places with them, to stand in their shoes, to heal and bridge the divisions, the stereotypes, the categories that keep us divided. And that's exactly what Jesus did, both in how he ministered, how he lived, and who he was as God incarnate, God made flesh. And that's never something we can do from a distance. It's never something we can do from behind a wall. It's never something we can do from behind a glass. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be taking a closer look at these stories from the Old Testament, not just stories about the patriarchs, but words from the prophets, the prophets that God sent to his people to remind them of what their mandate and their identity was when they lost track. We're going to look at how Jesus conducted his own ministry, how he related to these people that he healed and touched and brought back into community. And we're going to look at the latter part of the New Testament as well, the letters of Paul, to remember this mandate that we have been given, the specifics of it, who we are called to be and what we are called to do. And as we walk through this together, as we pray together about how God is leading us to break out of these walls and to be more visible, be more present in our community. As we read these stories, these scriptures together, I would invite you to look for places. Where are the gaps that are closed? Where are the distances that are closed? By the prophets, by Jesus, by the apostles, by the church. And what are the commonalities that are there? And I'll suggest that there are a few. Time. This ministry of reconciliation takes time. It involves a willingness to hear, not just to be heard as we proclaim this gospel message, but to hear others, to build relationships with other people, to get involved to come out and stay outside. Because this message that we have been given to proclaim is the message that the world needs to hear. That whoever you are, wherever you are, you are loved. You are forgiven. You are called to the inheritance of the very kingdom of heaven as a co-heir with Christ Jesus. To put it in Diane Weifert's terminology, God sees you, God knows you, and God is rooting for you because God wants the best for you because we are all God's children. We are loved. We are forgiven. God knows you, and God wants you to know God. So may we be a people about this ministry of reconciliation as we live together, as we work together, as we study together, as we pray together. May be we willing to watch, to be seen, to speak, and to hear. In the name of Christ and for the sake of the good news of the gospel. Amen.